Well, good morning. This is Barry O'Dell with the Church of Christ at Mammoth Spring Facebook page. It's Thursday morning, August 19th, 2021. We are ready for Acts chapter 9 today. Good to see folks joining on. Let's see here who we have. There's Diana. Good to see you, Diana. And Linda, good morning. Roger and Anita. Gail, Lyle, good to see everybody joining on today. We're streaming on the church page, but also cross-posted over to the Near Churches page. Hello, Owsleys. Hope you guys are doing well today. All right, of course, this is Thursday, and this will be the last stream of the week. Hello, Brian. Good to see you. So hope we'll see how far we get. Good morning, Derek. Uh, we'll see how far we get through Acts chapter 9 today. There's quite a bit here, and uh, we may... May get through it, we may not. I'm going to say we probably won't get through all through all of chapter nine, but that's okay. As always, like and share our videos. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to use the comment section. Throw that stuff in there, and I will acknowledge it when I see it. And uh, we are introduced to Saul of Tarsus back in. I know it's Acts chapter 7. What verse is it? Verse 58. They cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Hello, Billy. Good to see you. And so that's our introduction to the man that we're going to study about today, Saul of Tarsus. Of course, Acts chapter 8, Saul was consenting to his death, and then we get to Acts chapter 9. And we learn a bit more about Saul's zeal in persecuting the church. Starting in verse 1 here, the first nine verses were, were given the one of the accounts. There's actually three different accounts of what takes place here. And it's good to, and it, in fact, if you have the material that I've put together at the end of the Acts chapter 9 section, I think. I think it's at the end of the chapter 9 section. Yeah. Uh, I, I put together a chronology of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. So that's that's just interesting to note. It's recorded also in Acts chapters 22 and 26. So it's always good to put all those things together and come away with a, a more complete picture. Then Saul. So I'm going to read a few verses here. And the way chapter 9 starts with what it says in verse 1, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. I want to take just a real quick detour from chapter 9 here. So Luke is recording what's going on here, but over in Acts chapter 26, Paul now is giving an account of his his training, his early life, um, having been brought up as a Pharisee and all of that good stuff. And he says in Acts chapter 26, well, I'll just start reading in verse 9 here. He said, uh, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, this I also did in Jerusalem. Well, that's Stephen. That's Acts chapter 8. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Well, again, there's Stephen for you. That's exactly what happened. But listen to verse 11 here. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and the New King James says, compelled them to blaspheme. And the word compelled in the Greek means to force by external violence. Paul was no, or rather Saul, uh, was no gentle man. He was not a, he was not a kind person towards Christians. Let's just say that. He compelled with violence. He forced with violence people to, to speak out against Jesus Christ. And, and he would kill you. I mean, th this is who he was. And, and, and this is just my personal opinion well, I'm not going to share it because it's my personal opinion. But anyway, um, quite a background that he comes from. So back to Acts chapter 9. Breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if you found any who were of the way. Now that's interesting, any of the way. I think it's five times in the book of Acts the church is described as the way. Of course, that affiliates it with Jesus himself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14 verse 6 whether men or women. So Paul was not uh, Saul. I keep saying Paul. Saul was no uh, misogynist. He, man, he treated women just like he treated men. If you're a Christian, you're going to jail or you're going to die. 
whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And that is so important because um, back in Acts chapter 8, when you look at verse three and verses 3 and 4, well, especially verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. Well, when we have Jesus' perspective given on it, that's Luke recording it, but when Jesus speaks on it, he says, why are you persecuting me? And so a point that I try to make when using this particular text or teaching through here, the way we treat the church, the way we talk about the church, Christians, is the way we talk about and treat Jesus. That's just the way of it. And so we had better be very careful. You know, there are a lot of folks that are very almost eager to speak out against the Church of Christ, members of it now. And and I'll just I'll just give you a couple of examples. So one thing that I do to, when I get to the office first thing in the morning is I'll I'll do some reading for myself, or maybe I'll watch a, a short video on YouTube from you know a sermon or a lecture or something like that from the Bible. And uh, so YouTube will pick up kind of what you what you watch, and it'll feed you things that you might be interested in based on your history. Um, and so I had a video come up the other day done by, and I'll use this term loosely, done by a member of the church who the whole video he was talking about, and he loves this phrase because he does it all the time. He talks about his tribe, his religious tribe. Well, that's the Church of Christ. And then he proceeds to bash it about what it does wrong and, and how it could do things so much better. And um, I, <laughs> You better watch out. You're going you're, you're gonna to be judged for that. You're going to be judged for that. We better be careful the way we talk about and treat the church because Jesus said to Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. There again it is. It, this is personal. Uh, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Um, this was going to stop. This this direct confrontation, this direct commission by Christ. You know, Paul calls himself, hello, Sheila, late but here. Well, that's okay. It's as they say, if you can't get here on time, get here when you can. So glad you're here. Uh, it's hard to kick against the goads. And, well, we, we know what a goad is. It was a long pointy stick that a someone driving animals could use if they were kicking back or not doing what they were supposed to do. They'd, they'd uh, prod them along, as we say. Well, in a very real sense here, the apostle, or rather Saul, he's not the apostle yet, is being prodded along. And uh, his torture, his persecution against the church is going to come to an end. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Uh, and, and so that's an interesting question. You have a, you have a conversation. You're, you have the ability to converse directly with Christ. And your question is, what do you want me to do? Well, you know, a lot of folks, hello, Connie, a lot of folks say, well, you can't do anything. So what does Jesus say? Well, arise and go into the city and you will be told that you can't do anything because you can't save yourself. There's nothing you can do. If you're going to be saved, I'll save you and there's nothing you can do. That's a very popular religious theme that's in the world today. And that's not what that's not even what Jesus Christ himself said. You need to go into the city and it will be told you what you must do. So they do that. Now Saul's blind and they take him into Damascus. And uh, Acts chapter 9 is verse 9. 9 and verse 9 to me is important. He was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. And then you look down in verse 11, the very end of verse 11, he was praying. So he's fasting and he's praying and yet there's still something he must do how many of you guys over the years have heard of the sinner's prayer you know you accept jesus in your heart and you say this prayer and you will be saved this guy had a direct confrontation with the lord jesus told him you're going to be told what you must do he then spent three days in fasting and prayer and yet somebody still had to go to him and tell him what he must do and it wasn't accept Jesus in your heart and say a prayer. You know, so like yesterday, I was talking about the Ethiopian eunuch, and 
how the Holy Spirit communicated with Philip. He didn't communicate with the eunuch. He told Philip, go preach to this guy. Well, right here, if there's ever a time to say the sinner's prayer saves you, this is it. Because you have a sinner, Saul of Tarsus, spending three days in prayer after, ha after having been confronted by Jesus. And yet Jesus still says, you're going to be told what you must do. Um, that, to me, that's just a great, a great way to, to deal with that concept of a sinner's prayer and, and how unbiblical it is. All right, so now verses, I've got next, in the, if you look at the outline, next I've got verses 10 through 22, because verses 1 through 9, this is what happened to Saul, but then you shift scenes, beginning in verse 10, to a man by the name of Ananias in Damascus. And the Lord said to him, Ananias, he said, Lord, here am I. Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. And so here's the guy who's going to tell him what he must do. And again, this is all recorded. And, and this is one of the reasons knowing what Acts chapter 9 says, this is one of the reasons why it's good to also know how Saul re, or how Paul recounts it, recorded in chapter 22 and also in chapter 26, because he kind of gives us a an orderly account, whereas here in Acts 9, we go from Saul to Ananias to Saul and Ananias, and uh, it's broken down in those other chapters to give us, a, a again, a fuller picture. Good morning, Charles. Good to see you. And so... In a vision, he's seen you. You're coming. So Ananias answered. And I, I can get I get this here, what Ananias says. I understand this. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to you, or rather to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who will call on your name. Man, I get the hesitance here. Um, This guy helped kill Stephen. This guy's here to arrest people, and you're sending me? Well, Go. For he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Christ. So you have the twelve apostles. Of course, um, Matthew ten records what is it, verses one through four. Matthew ten records the the choosing of the twelve by Jesus. You know, Peter, Andrew, James. Of course, Judas kills himself. Uh, recorded in Acts chapter one. Matthias then takes his place. Um, so Matthias and Saul here are chosen in a different way um, than the other guys were. Now, they were both, obviously, uh, added to the apostleship by the Lord. Okay, you, you look at, for instance, Acts chapter 1, verses 25 and 26. You have the casting of lots and a prayer to God for, you know, sh which of these two men here in Jerusalem should we choose? Well, the lot fell to Matthias. That was, that was the Lord's answer. And then here... Um, you have Jesus directly, directly commissioning Saul that he would be an apostle. So Ananias went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he, ar and, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So there's the record of what happened. But here's what I want to do real quick. I want to go to Acts chapter 22, and let's listen to now Paul talking about what happened. So this starts in Acts 22 and verse 16. I'm sorry, Acts 22 and verse 12. Then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, Damascus, came to me, and he stood and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that same hour I looked up at him, then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be, and that's what happened uh, in verses 1 through 9 of Acts chapter 9. For you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And, so now verse 16. And now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. And actually the Greek language there at the end of verse 16 says, having called upon the name of the Lord. When he arose and was baptized, he was calling on the name of the Lord. He was doing what God told him to do. So this, this sinner's prayer 
and I'll just say it, the, the sinner's prayer junk is just that. This guy was, again, directly confronted by Christ, was struck blind miraculously, prayed and fasted for three days, and was still told, you, you're, you need to go here and you're going to be told what you must do. Ananias gets there and says, what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away. His sins were not washed away in prayer. His sins were not washed away in baptism. And so, man, the, the conversion of Saul is a, is, is a powerful example of what it means to be saved. It's a powerful example of what it means to have your sins washed away. Prayer cannot do it. Well, it can if you're already a Christian. If you've already been baptized into Christ, we understand that. But a person who is a sinner, who has never contacted the blood of Christ, cannot pray and be saved. Period. That's right, David. Sinner's prayer won't get you to heaven. Uh, it'll take you somewhere else if that's what you depend on. I'll tell you that much. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at, <clears throat> at Damascus. Immediately, he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Well, how could he do that? I mean, this guy was a Jew, a Pharisee uh, of the tribe of Benjamin. You know, you go to Philippians 3 and and you you look at his pedigree there. So how could he immediately go into the synagogues and preach Christ. Well, that goes back up. Look back at Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. The Lord sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. There it is. Now, Ananias was not a um, he was not an apostle. And so you don't have the apostolic imposition here of laying on of hands. This was done directly by the Lord. But the, the laying on of hands can also mean in the Bible the sense of a commission or someone being sent out. And that's what's happening here. But he could receive, or rather, he could immediately be preaching Christ because he had been filled with the Holy Spirit by the Lord himself. Connie says, this just popped up, he revived, he received the power of the Holy Spirit at his baptism then and not by the laying on of hands. Well, <laughs> I didn't see that comment, Connie, until I had already had already talked about it. This was this is a unique case. Again, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's verse 8 or 9. He says he was an apostle as of one born out of due season. And so this is quite different, again, than the 12 and then uh, Matthias of Acts chapter 1. He received the Holy Spirit from the Lord directly. So think about this. John chapter 1 and verse 33, we are told that it's Jesus Christ who baptizes people with the Holy Spirit. And I think that's what we have here with, with Saul of Tarsus because Ananias, Ananias didn't have that capability. Okay, so verse 20. He's baptized. He spends some time with the disciples in Damascus, immediately preached the, uh, the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Uh, you're welcome, Connie. Then all who heard were amazed. And again, I, I get that because of, because of his past. They're astonished. Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose? Everybody knew why he had initially come to Damascus because, well, you look back up at chapter 9 and verse 2, he had letters from him, from the high priest, to, to get men or women and arrest them and bring them to Jerusalem. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Well, that's the mission, you know, before, well, it's, it's like he says in, in other places in the New Testament. Um, he was an insolent man. I think that's the King James. The New King James says injurious. Uh, that was his job, was to persecute Christians, even to, even to the extent of, of murdering them. But now he is confounding people Again, because he's been filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, and now he's preaching the one that, that he had been persecuting for so long. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. So that's, that's another interesting turn, because he, he, bec he went from, from the prime killer of Christians to the prime target of the persecutors. The Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. And they watched the gate. Now, listen to this. I think this is an interesting point here. They watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night 
and led him down through the wall in a large basket. So we're going to stop there for today. We're not going to go beyond verse 24, but the point I want to make here from verse 24 is when he knew that persecution was, and we even see Jesus doing this, by the way, when he knew that persecution was coming, he didn't hang around and and commit, I guess the way I would phrase it is, he didn't commit self-martyrdom. He had a lot of work to do, and he got out of town. The disciples assisted him in that. You know, Christi- Christians are told, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Okay, that's that's what it says. And it's like Jesus said in the Gospels, um, well, it, <laughs> what did he say in the Gospels? Oh, if they've hated me, they will hate you also. Okay. But again, not even Jesus would hang around in situations where they were seeking to kill him. And we see the same thing here of Saul, and then also of uh, later becoming known as Paul. I mean, the Second Corinthians 11, 23 through 30 really gives us a lot of specifics on the types of persecution that he endured. And, uh, and, and, and it followed him everywhere. You know, you follow his progression throughout the book of Acts, and it's like anywhere he goes, trouble, trouble soon shows up uh, from, from typically Jewish, uh, P- Jewish sources because he's doing exactly what he used to persecute and exactly what those zealous Jews hate, and that's preaching that Christ is the Son of God. And so... Uh, you, you don't, a, a Christian doesn't look for persecution. You don't go out seeking to become a martyr. You know it's a possibility, uh, and you are told that if you live godly, you will suffer persecution. But there's a difference in knowing that and enduring that, 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16, as opposed to knowing that and then actively seeking out persecution. That's almost like... Uh, almost kind of like a form of, I guess I would say, narcissism and uh, maybe even egotism. Anyway, just some thoughts there. It's it's interesting to note those little details. They're going to kill him, and uh, yet let's get him out of here. Well, Connie says, Can you imagine how Paul must have felt after being converted, knowing he was one who had hunted Christians? Well, you know, you think about it, and I, I don't... This, so this is what I was going to say earlier, and I stopped. I didn't say it. but And I may be completely off base here, but remember Paul had this thorn in the flesh that he prayed three times that it be removed. And I, again, I'm, I'm not convinced on this one way or the other, but I've, I've wondered, I'll just say it that, I've wondered if that thorn was, Connie, was what you're just saying there. He had to live the rest of his life with the images of, Stephen, in his mind. I mean, he was there. And and whoever else he, as Acts 26, 11 says, whoever else he forced with external violence to blaspheme, he had to live with that stuff. And uh, that's, that's quite something to think about. Okay, well, I, I'll tell you what, let me look here. Okay, Sheila says, when did Saul's name change? Hmm. Sheila, I'm going to have to say, I don't have an answer for that right now. When did Saul's name change? (laughs) If anybody has a better answer than I do, put in the comment section. Uh, I'll have to look that up. To be honest, I've never really, I've never really considered that. I'll, but I'll do my work and I'll figure it out. Okay, guys, that's it for today. We're going to stop in Acts 9.24, and Lord willing, we'll be able to come back this mon- coming Monday. Hey, Mom. And we'll pick up in Acts 9 and verse 25. I don't see any other questions or comments. Just all the greetings. Good to see you guys here today. I appreciate it. Hope you all have a good day and a good rest of your week. And hope to see you back here Monday morning at 11 o'clock. Have a good day.